older people have always been known to be at a higher risk of death from COVID, but the number of deaths among older adults is rising faster than any other age group. Coming up on today's Morning Medical Update, we explain who is at risk and why. Hey, good morning. It's Friday, December the 9th. Welcome to the Morning Medical Update. It's true. I'm not Jessica Lovell. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, subbing in for just today. I'm hosting today's program from home because I've tested positive for COVID. Today, we're talking about new data from the CDC that found more than 90% of COVID deaths are happening among elderly adults. Okay, just pause for one second. I don't count myself as elderly yet at 63. But we'll ask Dr. Poland and Dr. Hawk in just a minute and our new other guests, uh, the, the Jessica Calendar-Rich, whether or not I actually qualify. We have an expert panel with us today to explain why our senior population is again more vulnerable. So make sure to get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You find links to those right here on your screen. This is our third holiday season where COVID is a concern. We talk daily about the importance of vaccines and boosters. The Kaiser Family Foundation recently released a report finding that the number of COVID deaths from people who are vaccinated has gone up. In the fall of 2021, three in 10 adults vaccinated or boosted still died of COVID. In April of this year, that number jumped to nearly six in 10 deaths. But now for the first time since the pandemic started, senior citizens make up more than 90% of the deaths. It's an age group that was first in line for the vaccines. And last summer, people over 65 made up roughly 58% of deaths. So why the spike? One contributing factor can be found in the numbers from late November, showing that only one third of people over the age of 65 have received the bivalent boosters. By the way, I got my bivalent booster. I would like to say early and often, but just once does suffice. Today, we're pleased to welcome vaccinologist Dr. Gregory Poland. He's the director of the Mayo Clinic's Vaccine Research Group. We welcome him back. He's been a, a guest with us before, as has outstanding geriatrician Dr. Jessica Callender-Rich, who is with us here at the health system. Dr. Poland, help us explain the importance of the bivalent vaccine. Yeah, Steve, that's a good question, and sorry to hear that uh, you got infected. That seems to be an inevitability. But the important part, and this relates to your question, is you didn't end up in the hospital, you're not on a ventilator, and you're certainly not going to die. Um, and that's the value of the bivalent vaccine. Does it prevent infection? Yes, but at a rate of about 40, 50 percent. Does it prevent severe disease, hospitalization, and death? Highly effective. And that's the reason to get this booster. You know, just to say, I've done great. You know, I felt like I had a mild cold, the first one in three years, by the way, and I did not miss having colds. And <laughs> I was in for a couple of days, but now I'm just driving my cat crazy because she's the only one here at the house with me. My wife, when she comes home, she puts on her mask, she goes to another room, and I got my mask <laughs> on, and I'm ready to go back to work. You know, Zoom meetings are great, but they, they I, I get a little Zoom crazy after a while, yeah. so... And it doesn't take a lot to drive me crazy. So, well, Dr. Pollitt, why are we seeing deaths go up for those who are vaccinated? You know, Steve, you really put your finger on it in, in the opening. And it's really sort of a perfect storm. You're right. Seniors, knowing they were at higher risk, were the first ones to get their primary series, their first booster. A lot of them have not gotten the second booster. And that immunity from their first booster has waned over time. In addition, the variants that are circulating now are increasingly immune evasive, meaning that whether you had infection, vaccination, or both, over time, your immunity wanes and these new variants get around that immunity. So it's, it's not surprising at all. Uh, by the way, I wrote a paper about 20 years ago on the apparent paradox of measles in highly vaccinated populations. And, you know, to kind of put it simply, when 100% of your population is immunized, all of the cases occur in immunized people. So we're seeing a higher immunization rate. And so you're going to see so-called breakthrough infection at a higher rate in that 
higher percent of the population. So people should not think of it as a failure of the vaccine. Is this a perfect vaccine? No, I'd be the first one to say as a vaccinologist, it isn't. Is it an excellent vaccine in preventing the, <clears throat> the outcomes we really care about? Absolutely, in addition to reducing the risk of long COVID and of complications from COVID. Yeah, I think that long COVID, because so far on my, I, I don't have complications yet outside of, you know, I'm a little crazy, but that's that again, things like that. <laughs> and, um, but I think the, 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 the point is that if you were vaccinated a year ago and now you wonder, am I vaccinated? The answer is you're really not so vaccinated anymore, right? I think that's part of the challenge we face. And if people will get the bivalent vaccination, they'll reestablish that safety threshold. Was that your sense? Exactly. And, you know, I mean, I, I hate to point to you, Steve, but you're, you're a great example of this. You got your bivalent booster, you got infected, but, you know, if this were not transmissible, you'd be at work. You feel Absolutely. that well. So it yep. really converted what can be a serious and deadly disease to, let's call it a minor annoyance. Um, and, and it and that's, is a minor annoyance. Yeah, that's the, that's the beauty, uh, although I suspect if we ask the cat... <laughs> Yeah, the cat would probably say, I'm very annoying. <laughs> Dr. Calendar Rich, is this consistent with what you're seeing with your patients? Absolutely. But I want to go back first and tell you that age is just a number, Steve. Mm. So really, it's all about how Thank you're you moving. Thank you for that, Josh. Right. It's all, <laughs> it's all about how you're moving and grooving and how healthy you are overall. And those things are really going to impact your outcomes um, regardless of your age. That said, yes, we are definitely seeing more patients that are older get sicker. And whether that's, you know, duration out from vaccine or how their immune systems really respond as, as they change as we age, um, either way, we're seeing certainly a, a higher risk for those older adults. He's really a young elderly. So, Jessica, I want to go back to one thing you said. You said moving and grooving. I want to be clear that I can move. Move. Grooving is perhaps a challenge <laughs> that is beyond my reach. So, Jessica, we've talked a lot about how isolated our older communities were in the beginning of the pandemic. Take us down that memory lane a little and, and, and not being able to visit the, the, how that compares with the threat now and how are nursing homes handling this part of the pandemic today? You know, we really saw um, on, a, on a huge national level the, the negative consequences of isolation for those older adults. And we knew that those consequences existed and were possible. And in very early times of the pandemic, we were so focused on the public health, um, you know, that uh, increased cases and protecting everyone the best that we knew how then. Um, we saw a lot of decline in other faculties from that isolation. And at some point, um, I, I think it was earlier this year, actually, the um, governing bodies over the nursing homes came out and said, you know, we, we were requiring you to prevent visitors, and now we are prohibiting you from preventing visitors. And so um, we've really moved to a place where nursing facilities are, are really required to allow any of those visitors in. Um, we know that older adults are, are really in need of socialization, of increased contact with other people of again that like getting up and moving around uh, to prevent all kinds of, of increased complications both of the COVID and just of the not moving and so um, so we are seeing frankly more people have those visitors and it's a good thing that is good thing. I noticed you didn't say grooving this last time Jessica <laughs> <laughs> All right, we want you to know where to find the latest COVID information. We have a QR code up on your screen. Scan it and it will take you to our COVID update uh, page. So Dr. Calendar Rich, from a mental health perspective, what is the best way to protect this population? You know, the best way to protect the older adult um, from any mental health consequences, both of COVID and of, of the isolation and of anything else that exists is really ongoing interaction with people. Right, with people within your family, if that's the option, the options with people outside your family. You know, I, I often will even recommend like you need to get together with people, whether it's in person or online or whatever it is, we have to keep that communication and socialization going in order to maintain our mental health and in order to maintain our health overall. Yeah, so Dr. Poland, the threat of the new COVID strain, you talked about that immune and invasive part. 
if you get it, are they making people as sick? Yeah, it's, it's hard to know. In the laboratory, there's more cellular damage from these subvariants. Uh, in, in clinical care, you know, there's a, there's a baseline level of immunity we've now achieved in our society. And I don't think people are getting as sick as they did prior to uh, infection, prior to some level of, of immunization. But these are still very virulent variants. And in fact, now the BQ1, the BQ1.1, and now a variant that I'm very concerned about, the most immune evasive variant we've seen yet is rapidly rising called XBB. And, you know, I don't want to be dramatic about this, but I also want to be very honest about it. The rapid rise of these subvariants means that there are very likely people listening to our voice today that by Christmas time are not going to be able to enjoy Christmas with their family or are going to end up in the hospital or, God forbid, not with us. So it's really important that people sort of shake off this COVID fatigue and lethargy and take action to protect themselves. We are not helpless here. Do you think the bivalent vaccines will still help protect against the XBB variant? I think so in the, in the sense of severe disease, in the sense of uh, infection alone, no. And that's a reminder to us that taking steps to protect ourselves, our vaccines, and wearing a proper mask properly. You know, in, in the last 10 days, we've seen a 30% increase in COVID cases, COVID hospitalizations, and admission COVID admissions to the ICU. And that's post-Thanksgiving. As we go into Christmas, I'm very, very concerned that we're going to be in a position where we're not gonna be able to offer optimal medical care uh, you know, in the state of Minnesota, Steve, uh, of our uh, pediatric ICU beds, only two are open because of RSV and flu. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge, and we're seeing the same rise here. I wonder, Logan, can you pop that graph of the U.S. hospitalizations uh, in for just a second? Because I think it illustrates exactly what Dr. Poland was saying. Thank you. And you can see the difference, uh, Dr. Poland. You might comment, or and, and uh, as well as Jessica, you might comment um, on this because there's a significant increase in the rise in numbers across the country. To your point, 30, 35 percent. And our numbers were jumping here in our health system, as Hawkeye will get to in just a moment. But this number of, of, of the deaths and, and things that we're seeing in the rise in hospitalization in the um, older, uh, higher age groups is exactly what we're seeing today. Yeah. And it is, I think it's a source of great concern for us as yeah. we go in. And you know, uh, St Steve, is, I mean, as, as you guys well know, um, and maybe to say it very clearly, with the exception perhaps of the most immunocompromised, I think we should say that there is no reason today that anybody should die of COVID. Take the if appropriate steps. If they're vaccinated and if they get sick, they can take Paxlovid, you know, there are, are others that- Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, it the is other, a little worried. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, the other point about these variants, uh, Steve, that I think is really worth making and, uh, you know, Hawk has seen this too. Um, uh, our, our monoclonal antibodies are no longer effective. So we that whole toolbox of what we had to both prevent infection and treat infection, uh, we no longer have. So we're down to the three antivirals and, if necessary, convalescent plasma. That's it. So uh, we really need people to take this very, very seriously. I'm with you, and I, I'm actually feeling a little naked. As if I put on my chief medical officer hat for the hospital, <laughs> um, feeling a little naked here. Influenza spikes is high. <laughs> RSV is still out there. The hospitals flew, uh, are full of, of, of folks and full of influenza, and now we're seeing COVID numbers really take off a bit more. So here's a question for both of you, and 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 Hawk, you too. Are you making any changes to your holiday plans? Are we going to should we start doing? Should we start talking about masking a lot more in, in groups? I'm happy to start. Um, we, we made a couple of uh, changes to our holiday plans. One is that my daughter-in-law is pregnant with our second grandson, and we decided as badly as we want to see them that this was probably not a good time 
uh, to travel with a little one and then being pregnant. So we're going to hold off probably until the January time frame. The other thing is that uh, before we get together, we are testing to be sure nobody's mildly or asymptomatically infected. And when we are indoors with people who are not our immediate family, we are wearing an N95 mask. I think it's, yeah, I'm afraid it's all coming back. It, it feels like, and we're, I, this is not an alarmist program. We are not alarmist people. Um, but the numbers are going up and people aren't as well protected and these new variants are are to be concerned about and, and I, I have a fear that we're going to be having these big community conversations again very soon because of the stress on hospitals. Dr. Calendrich, how about you and your holidays? Yeah, you know, we um, are a family who is lucky to have lots of little kids running around between cousins and our household. And um, so we're really focusing in on not, you know, if somebody in your household is sick, that household's not coming to spend that um, holiday time with us and really looking at ventilation. You know, can we keep windows open? Can we keep mm. doors open? How can we sort of maximize our time together but minimize our risk? Yeah, that makes sense. Hawkeye, what are you doing this, this holiday? Yeah, I'll actually be here in the hospital trying to get people out so they can be back home with their loved ones. <laughs> but I would say it, it really does start. We need to continue to endorse the fact of what we heard about uh, what Dr. Poland talked about. Be up to date with those vaccines because of the, uh, the benefits they provide. Take in your own individual risk and understand what to do. And then, yes, testing is still available. I think there is a plethora of antigen tests out there. Certainly would recommend and just understanding the sensitivity of those tests, you know, maybe wanting to check two or three days in a row before that, but understanding your own individual um, risk for disease and uh, adverse outcomes and doing those things to help minimize that as much as possible. You know, uh, can, can I just to follow on to what Hawk said, because I find so many of my patients don't know this. If you're on Medicare, you can go to your pharmacy and you're entitled to eight free home tests a month, a month per individual. And the vast majority of insurance companies also provide free at-home tests. So there's no real reason for the majority of people to not have access to that. We're going to return to these themes in just a moment. I want to talk some more about the antivirals and the importance of those. But I want to now turn to Hawk to say, uh, our medical director for infection prevention control, how are our COVID numbers looking? And I'm afraid to see the counts. I think I saw them earlier. Ouch. Yeah, they're not they're not looking good, Steve. So uh, just to recap, we have altered the way we present this to the the public. Right now, we have our total numbers on the top line. So that includes our actives plus our recovering patients. 61 total, but of those, 43 are active. Unfortunately, what we have seen is a large jump in our ICU patients with 11 patients in the ICU now, two of those on the ventilator. So we have gone from mid to low 20s, crept up to low 30s for a couple days, but now have been in the 40s for our active infections. But importantly, it looks like a good proportion of those are in the ICU. And Logan, pop up that graph that just shows the total number of rise in the United States, because I think it's going to um, harken back to what Dr. Poland was just saying. Um, and, and I think it's, yeah, there's that, not that one, but uh, it's right with the heat map. If you go to the next, I may have sent it to you too late this morning. Yeah, that, that heat map, if you look real carefully right there in the middle of the country, unfortunately, Kansas is starting to light up and, and spilling into Missouri. And of course, there's been the one, the outbreak in the Southwest that hasn't really quieted down too much. And so if you just look at it, it's starting to get darker across the country. Was there another one after that? All right, so Dr. Hawk, the FDA just authorized the COVID Omicron vaccinations yeah. for children as young as six months old. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the criteria. You know, I think this is great. This is certainly needed. Um, we've been waiting for this as far as the bivalent boosters. Uh, it is somewhat confusing though, because we have number one, the ages, uh, which are six to five for Moderna, six to four uh, for the Pfizer for this particular um, subject. 
And we also have different, uh, the different companies with Moderna, the primary dose is two doses, uh, the primary series. With Pfizer, the primary series is three. So basically, if you have received Moderna, you're six months to four years, you can get that new booster, which includes the original uh, spike variant uh, from the original isolate, but also now the BA4, BA5 spike, so the bivalent, you can receive that third dose. So you have three exposures to spike, two in the primary series, one for the booster. The other thing is if you have received Pfizer, um, if you have completed your Pfizer uh, primary series, which is three doses, you uh, are not currently eligible for the Pfizer because you've had three exposures. But if you've had two and not the third, you can get that uh, Pfizer booster, which is the bivalent booster. So it is a little bit confusing. It is very important to talk with your pharmacist or your physician, your pediatrician on exactly where you are in that primary series uh, for Moderna or Pfizer if you have a child that is six months to either four years or five years of age. Dr. Hawke, new study found plasma from those who are vaccinated and recovering from COVID could be used as passive immunotherapy against new Omicron variants. Thoughts about this one? It's a yeah, little bit about back to the future again, huh? Yeah, I'd certainly like to, to get Dr. Poland's thoughts, but just to break this study down, this was a uh, more of a meta-analysis <laughs> and it was not really clinical. It was looking at different studies that looked at people who uh, have been vaccinated. It looked at people who have been vaccinated and infected with Omicron, um, really looking at neutralization by antibodies um, of those people. And what they found was that those people that were vaccinated uh, had their booster, had three doses, and had an Omicron infection, had really good neutralization and antibodies to uh, what we have heard uh, Dr. Poland talk about, BQ1.1, XBB, and then another, um, another variant as well. Um, I think it's a large leap, however, to make the jump to now we can use this as convalescent plasma therapy. We certainly would like to, and we have tried convalescent plasma for many, many diseases, even most recently COVID-19. However, a lot of the randomized control trials did not bear a lot of benefits unless, number one, it was very high concentration. And again, even more, I think, important than the antivirals such as Paxlovid and Remdesivir is the fact of getting this plasma early. So I think it is good news and understanding uh, that those people that had been boosted and then infected have very good neutralization, but they also saw that people who just had vaccination without infection had good neutral, neutralization, although it was lower. I think it, it's a large leap to make, but just as we heard Dr. Poland say, we don't have that ability now to treat with our engineered monoclonal antibodies just yet. So I think it is one thing to continue to, uh, to explore, but I think there are very strict criteria for using convalescent plasma as a therapy, and would certainly like to listen to Dr. Poland's thoughts on that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Hawk, I absolutely agree with you. You know, this, again, this was a, a meta-analysis, and so to, the reporting has kind of been, you know, new therapy again, and, and I think that's unfortunate. Let me try to give an analogy. If the virus is this highlighter, what we do when we give the vaccine is just the spike portion. When we give a monoclonal antibody, it's just against this spike portion. But when you get infected, you develop antibodies against all of the components of the virus. And so in the sense that plasma is polyclonal rather than monoclonal, there may be some benefit there. But I think, you know, we're looking at neutralization titers suppressed by over 100 fold with the XBB variant. Uh, I agree with Hawk, it's a leap to assume that uh, those sera are going to be um, necessarily curative uh, in a case like this. And I think the antivirals are our first option. So, Dr. Paul, I want to pivot. Let's talk a little bit about the antivirals. So, you know, we, we've been using Paxlovid with great success. There's this whole worry about rebound and all that, yet Paxlovid still looks really effective. It does. And, you know, I, I think uh, for appro in, in appropriate cases, Paxlovid is an excellent drug to use. 
um, like you, Steve, my, my wife, and she's given me permission, my wife also had a very mild case of uh, COVID and took uh, Paxlovid, had no rebound, but you know, a lot of people get this kind of awful taste in their mouth. She solved it by coating the pills in peanut butter. So maybe that will help oh, some of you, our, our listeners. We're going off label here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, you, again, you're reducing uh, the risk of the disease progressing, you're reducing the risk of complications, you're reducing the risk of long COVID. What's not to like about this drug? Well, maybe one thing, and that is there's a list of about 150 over-the-counter supplements and prescribed medications that you either cannot take or would have to reduce the dose. And that's really an area where you need to be in close contact with your healthcare team to decide how best to use Paxlovid. Yeah, so let's, uh, I'm gonna make one other quick pivot and then I wanna go to Dr. Calvin Rich for just a second. So um, one of the challenges has been that the virus keeps mutating is it are we going to have to pivot the vaccinations again and how long do you think monoclonal before monoclonal antibodies can catch up to the xbb variant are you asking me yes sir oh, <laughs> I, <am>. sorry. <laughs> I thought it was jesse's dirt um well i i don't think they're going to catch up with xbb the the uh, big farm is not putting any additional money the federal government's not putting additional money into monoclonal antibody research for COVID. And the problem, and you can kind of understand it, we are now, and uh, Hawk, I wonder if uh, you, would, you would think the same thing. I've never really seen this in my career before as a vaccinologist. We've gone from mutations where we had single strains or lineages. We had alpha, you know, uh, uh, delta, et cetera to what's known as convergent evolution, meaning what we have now are a swarm of subvariants vying for dominance. And so the meaning of that in terms of monoclonals is the, by the time you develop and license a monoclonal, the variants have moved on. And that's happening because we're not getting vaccinated. We're not wearing masks. I mean, <laughs> what's that old saying? We've met the enemy and he is us. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think we're gonna see a lot of monoclonal uh, activity. Now it's possible there, there could be mutative reversion such that they could become susceptible again to known uh, monoclonals, but I wouldn't hold my breath for that. So really, we need Dr. McCoy in his lab on the Enterprise synthesizing these <laughs> on an urgent basis. Got it. All right. Dr. Calendar Rich, uh, nursing homes in the past with these new variants or the original variant were left a little unprotected. Now that we have more visitation, which clearly we need to do, but are, are nursing home patients ever more vulnerable again? I mean, I would say yes, certainly, you know, nursing home patients, but also really any any adult with any measure of frailty that's out there is going to be at higher risk again, because they're going to have increased risk. You know, as the as the numbers rise in the community, the numbers then always we've seen over the last couple of years begin to rise in the nursing facilities. And so we're seeing outbreaks again, um, very similarly to how we were now, not as nearly as many people are getting as sick. Um, but and and I guess we'll wait to see if that changes in the next few months. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm getting a little nervous here, and I'm a little especially with the lower rates of vaccination. So, are patients in nursing homes that you're seeing any movement toward getting the bivalent vaccine a little more frequently? So some um, facilities have been really good about bringing in pharmacies and bringing in vaccines and really being very intentional in making sure that their residents have been up to date. And that's with support of families, obviously, but also uh, local health departments and other local resources. Um, other places have been less um, focused in on the vaccination programs. And so, you know, I would say that if, if somebody out there has a loved one in a facility, they need to be asking those questions and ensuring that they have a program set up within their facility. That's, boy, that feels so true. And again, I think we, in Hawkeye, we're seeing the numbers rise. It's, and it's not, you know, it's not like last November yet, yeah. but I also think the curve is starting to escalate, the, 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 um, uh, the steepness, if you will, of the curve is beginning to escalate. 
Yeah, certainly, and, I, and I'd, I'd like to hear Dr. Poland's thoughts on this, but you know, right now, again, we've talked about therapy. We don't have that uh, outpatient alternative therapy of the monoclonal antibodies. We do have the preferred therapies of Paxlovid, which is an oral drug. We also have remdesivir. If you come into the hospital, unfortunately, all you're gonna be able to get is remdesivir. I'd like to hear comments about, you know, I think it would be beneficial to look at and study those people that come in and they are five or seven days from the symptom onset, the ability to use Paxlovid in the hospital. Um, I'm not really sure that there's been a lot of data on that, especially for those higher risk patients. Um, looking at it when it's early in that process to help prevent progression to the ICU the ventilator and of course death as well. So right now we do have those therapies, but unfortunately if you come to the hospital, even if you're three days in, because we know especially a lot of the elderly patients with those comor comorbidities can be pushed over the edge, not just for COVID, but because now COVID has increased their heart failure or their lung disease, things of that nature. All right, well, I'm gonna to turn to Alexa Stilson and ask uh, how the community questions or reporter questions are going on out there. And Alexis, I wanna make a point. Um, just because I'm at home mean, doesn't mean I can't still rock, because I think I'm showing Logan and our team that I'm pretty successful at rocking back and forth even at home. Yeah, and you, you can just rock in general. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah it's, that's the word. You rock. Because I could groove too. That's yeah. right. That's what, that's what they say on the street. Um, we're yeah. getting a lot of questions, doctors, uh, from mm -hmm. the community, and there's some really good ones. And I know Dr. Calendar Rich has to go because uh, she's got patients to see, so I wanna get to the ones for Dr. Calendar Rich first because I think we only have you. You turned into a pumpkin at, at 8.35, so we have four minutes. Um, <laughs> here's a question. Ann Smith writes, I am a 69-year-old with a couple of risk factors. I've had all five vaccine booster doses. I developed symptoms of a bad cold on December 1st. I had a negative antigen test that day. Second test was positive. I was treated with Paxlovid, never had a fever. Gosh, this is very long. Her bottom, mm. her, her bottom question is, do I need a negative antigen test in order to attend an event if I'm masked and distancing? There's a celebration tomorrow. Oh gosh, this is, um, I'm gonna answer and then I wanna hear what Dr. Poland and Dr. Hawkinson have to say because they are certainly the experts. Okay. You know, I think, um, our goal is always to protect our own risk and always to, and also to protect the risk of the people around us. And there is some data that suggests that that antigen test really tells a lot about how we can sort of spread that virus. So from my perspective, if it's my family, you know, I'm going to want that negative test, two of them actually, uh, one day apart in order to sort of join that um, festivities without, without masking. I have one more question. We can get back to that in a second. Do you mind if I just ask Dr. Calendar Rich one more from a patient? Because I know you got to go in two minutes and then go, we'll for go back to that. Go okay. for it. Uh, Joellen McGranahan writes I'm over 70, got my bivalent booster in October. I'm on meds. I attend an indoor exercise class, but I'm the only one who wears a mask. I need this class for many reasons. How safe am I? You know, that, that's a really good question um, because, because people really do need, you know, that moving and grooving that yeah. we talked about earlier, yeah. that socialization that we talked about earlier, and a lot of that mental health can really play into a person's really prognosis and how, how they do for the rest of their lives. And um, so certainly there's always some risk. But we always have to take into account, like, how, what are we weighing here? The risks and the benefits. And if the benefits of going to this class and perhaps being the only one to wear a mask and standing, you know, farther away from the group than everybody else is, things like that, then those benefits may outweigh the risks for you. Uh, but each mm. person really has to assess that really differently and on mm. their own. Um, Anne wants to know, when would a person need to see a geriatrician versus a family practice doctor or internist? Would it be based on an age limit or other factors? This is my favorite question. <laughs> so, um, uh, so geriatricians are subspecialists that have either primarily been trained in internal medicine or family medicine. And the focus is really on persons that have increased frailty. So we have additional training in things like memory disorders, mobility problems and falls, uh, polypharmacy, so people who are taking lots of medicines that might um, interact with one another or might perhaps have a, um, a downstream effect 
effect that uh, could be negative. And so I would say that, you know, for me, age is always just a number. It's really just a number. And as a person perhaps is getting more frail and they're, they have more complicated uh, medical conditions that include that kind of frailty piece, that's a great time to have a geriatrician. Now that said, we also can serve as supports to a primary care internist or family medicine physician. So we can function as consultants also. So I say all that to say a person doesn't have to give up their regular doctor they've known for years. Um, we can just sort of step in and help with that or, or do primary care. I love that answer. Um, Dr. Callender Rich, we know you have to go. Um, so thank you for answering that lightning round. Doctors mm -hmm. still remaining. We still have some awesome questions, so I want to keep going. Um, keep going on that. Was there anything you wanted to add, Dr. Stites or Dr. Hawkinson, I believe, you wanted to add on the person who wondered if they needed a negative antibody test to attend a big party they have for tomorrow? Hawk, uh, go for it. You know, I would say that if really if, if you're 10 days out from that initial symptoms onset or if you're 10 days out from any rebound symptoms, I would say you probably do not need that antigen test. Um, again, we know the sensitivity of antigen tests aren't necessarily that good. And certainly I think with the recommendations of the CDC of you can get back into normal life after about those 10 days of a total from the symptoms onset or that rebound of symptoms, I, I think you'd be okay to do that. But certainly I'd like to listen to Dr. Stites and Dr. Poland. Well, I just said the image just can stay positive for a while, Dr. Poland, so I'm not sure it's very helpful in that setting. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I agree with uh, both of you. Uh, live your life. Uh, wear a mask. I mean, that's appropriate. But uh, the reason for uh, what Hawk is saying is that, you know, I, I wouldn't be concerned, is if there's actually any live virus, that viral load or titer is so low as to be virtually non-infectious to somebody else. Um, and most of the time, unless somebody's immunocompromised, that continuing positive is probably not representative of live virus. Great question coming in. This is from Gene, and so many people are wondering how to back time when they got their COVID versus when they get their booster. Uh, case in point, he writes, I had COVID late September, been waiting about three months to get bivalent. Is that a good plan? Go get it. <laughs> yeah, I, sooner, sooner. How long do you wait after your infection? How, how you know, long there, do you there's, wait? There, there is no hard and fast rule. What I'll say is the longer you wait, the better the effect of the booster. But you recognize the tension there. The longer you wait, the more you're unprotected. And so I think most of us, uh, Stephen Hawk, I'm interested to hear what you say, would say, you know, two, three months is uh, an adequate wait time and then get boosted. It's really been what we've been yeah. saying the whole time, Hawkeye. And I think, again, as we come into this holiday season, we see the rise in these variants. We see the rise in hospitalizations. We see the rise in deaths. Because, you know, for a while, deaths didn't rise, but they're starting to now. And so, which is typically what we've seen. And if you look at the steepness of the curve, it's beginning to look like at first it was a slow rise, but that's happened with each of the other peaks. And I'm not I, I think we're I think it's, I think we're into another wave here because we're seeing all those pre-wave characteristics is beginning to escalate. I think we're going to see the same thing with deaths. I think hospitals are going to be full again, and I think we just the more you can take protective measures, the better. And, and I, that would be my advice. And I, I I I so agree with that. I hope people hear that uh, clearly. On top of it. We really are dealing with this, you know, kind of quote, tridemic. Uh, in addition to COVID, you know, if we showed that same heat map for COVID uh, that we do for influenza and RSV, it would be bright red. Yeah. I mean, it's just, a, it's just a terrible situation, and it's, uh, it's, you know, that it's like that scenario where you, you look ahead and you can see there's a car accident. You're trying to warn the people behind you, and they're ignoring you, and one after another plowing into one another. Yeah, and we can't claim that it's a foggy day. It's clear as day what's happening here. And, Good yeah, analogy. Uh, yeah, I, and then we, we, we do it. Sorry, Alexis, go ahead. Well, I was, just handed, I was just handed an email from our news director here, Jill. This comes from the Kansas City Star, uh, um, Natalie Wallington. 
She would like to know if uh, Dr. Hawkinson could talk about the increase in flu-like illness in Kansas mm -hmm. and whether we're saying the same thing in Missouri. Mm -hmm. All right, influenza, and, and I don't know, um, Logan, if you may have the heat map that we had on Wednesday from, from influenza to pop up there while Hawkeye's talking. Yeah, we, we tried to address this. Certainly, uh, I think the heat map is going to be the best. I think all over the nation, and we have showed some influenza-like activity, ILI, uh, influenza-like illness, which is defined, again, as fever and either cough or sore throat. So it's a very broad definition. But we know that we see the uptick in that during the respiratory viral season as these viruses are circulating. Not just SARS-CoV-2, not just influenza, but RSV, rhinovirus, metanumavirus, all these common coughs and cold. And so you will have more visits to your medical uh, institutions, whether that's urgent care, your primary care, emergency department, hospital. So what we have seen is the uptick nationally. Um, and I think that is pretty consistent throughout the nation. Um, I think that is consistent in Kansas, but also in Missouri as well. And, and I know Dr. Stites wanted to, to show a heat map, but that's what I would say is that nationally, it's pretty consistent that that influenza-like illness visits to uh, medical institutions has increased. But we also know that definite diagnoses of RSV, influenza, and SARS-CoV-2, or COVID-19, are increasing as well. So Dr. Stites, she has a follow-up for you. Uh, she wants to know, is hospital capacity strained in the Kansas City area because of these illnesses? This. Yeah, it is higher. I mean, I, I can't, we haven't had our CMO call this week, so I can't spit, um, um, be real specific, although we'll, we'll try and get our CMOs back on the program again soon. The, um, but what we can say is here at KU, I think our census today was about 846, I believe. I just saw it earlier this morning. And, you know, that's a lot. And what I would say to you is that we, you know, in a bad flu year, we'll have 30 or 35 influenza patients hospitalized. And that's considered a terrible flu year. Well, COVID today we have, what was the number, Hawkeye, 61? So we're higher than we ever are with influenza. Yeah, the other influenza patients, that's another 30 influenza patients. They had RSV. We easily, in those three diseases, have about 100 patients hospitalized. That's about an eighth of our, hospital, of our population in the hospital. The challenge for hospitals isn't just that. It means that we can't get to address people with time-sensitive diagnoses or time-critical diagnoses, and that's my fear. So it's something we will be watching on. We follow the Mark, uh, you know, Mark, the Metropolitan Area Re Regional Council has their dashboard we look at. But uh, I would say that we are starting to teeter into that, that you know, warning zone um, where it, it, we're going to have to start talking to people again about following the rules of infection control. Because remember what we always say, the rules of infection prevention control follow you wherever you go and they help keep you safe. And the rules are still the same. This is, this is the same rule. And, and one of them is, you know, you, you may have to think about masking a little bit more. And we're not saying, oh, we have to have a community-wide mask mandate. We're just saying, guys, we're, we're starting to get into that yellow danger zone again. Does, and to clarify, does flu-like, when we say flu-like illnesses, does that include COVID and RSV, or are those considered separate? Hawkeye. Yeah, it does include. It is based on uh, symptoms, so fever, plus either cough or sore throat. It has been uh, really tapered down as far as looking at symptoms. Uh, but influenza-like illness, that is a broad category, and then you get to the, the actual diagnosis. But it does include a lot of different viruses. It does include influenza. SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, RSV, and again, all those other common cough and cold viruses that may bring somebody to go get evaluated by a medical professional. Gene has a question. Alexis, specific. one more question, then we we'll probably have to you. wrap up, I think. This is okay. about you, so, um, and Gene uh -oh. be disappointed. Uh -oh. He wants to know personally what you've been doing to care for yourself during COVID. It, uh, he wants to know if you took Paxlovid, mm -hmm. if you're comfortable sharing your medical medical yeah, no, I'm happy to. So, he wants to know everything. you know i've always said yeah chicken chicken noodle soup is good for the soul but uh <laughs> no you know what um i did not take pack slowly because i'm on another medicine that makes it hard to take pack slowly to, to, to dr paul's earlier point uh there are some drugs that can interfere the second thing is the trajectory i knew i had 
I had the bivalent back vaccination in the beginning of October. I felt really you know mm -hmm. safe from that, and and um, so I still tried to exercise by walking a little bit and getting some good sleep, which is actually that's different for me because I often don't sleep as much, and um, <laughs> and you know trying to eat pretty healthy and just kind of staying home and not going out around others and and trying to be a little less um, you know just kind of be a little less um, uh, of a mess on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> These are the things I do. But so the answer to the question really is what I did is I modified it to follow all the right infection control guidelines. I stayed home. If anybody was in my house, like my wife, I would wear a mask. I did try to sleep a little more, drank a lot of liquid, you know, just did the things that you need to do to take care of yourself, uh, but did not take back slowly because of a drug drug interaction with another drug I was on. So. And I feel great, you know. I, I, you know, I'll probably go out and uh, earlier this week I walked a couple of miles, and, and I'll, I'll do the same thing today. I did walk yesterday because it's a little rainy here, so I thought that was probably not the right thing to do. We need you back. All right. It's not the same yeah, in person. I'm going to be back driving everybody crazy in no time at all. Uh, <laughs> I'll be moving and grooving. All right. This has been a wonderful conversation today, and I want to thank all of our guests for being here. Let's get some final thoughts. Dr. Poland, thank you for being back on the program. I oh. love listening and hearing to you. Hearing well, you. It, it's, a, it, it's a privilege to, to work with you guys. And Steve, I wish you every uh, rapid recovery and uh, happy holidays to the whole team there. Uh, but for me, I think, uh, you know, do the things that we've talked about on this show so many times. These are layers of mitigation efforts. Get updated on your vaccine or up to date if you're not up to date. Wear a, ma a proper mask properly when you're indoors. Save yourself RSV, influenza, and COVID-19. And by the way, you can get co-infected with more than one of those, and that's a miserable. That can be a miserable situation. Uh, I think just take those basic precautionary measures, but live your life. Yeah, it is so important. We learned in the first round of the pandemic, the mental health aspects of this disease and, and some of the, the isolation were really difficult. And, and, and let, let's keep each other safe. Try not to go back to that part of our past. Doc Hawk, final thoughts. Yeah, again, thank you to Dr. Poland for being on the show. I think it helps lend us some credibility, Steve. So that is always good. Um, I certainly would continue to endorse all of those things that were said, especially if you're traveling now. You know, you want to be well when you get to your destination. You want to be well, help prevent uh, transmitting the virus to others that may be more at risk. I know I'll be traveling soon. Um, I will be wearing a mask. Uh, that's my personal choice. I want to be well for when I get there, but I also want to be well for when I have to come back and work over that Christmas holiday as well. The other issue is we've heard about vaccines and when should I get my, my booster? When should I get revaccinated after COVID? I think we heard that answer. I think it's, it's spot on. The other thing, and we had this question yesterday, should I get vaccinated after having influenza? The absolute answer is yes, we know that you can be infected uh, and then get infected with another circulating strain. So it's vitally important. If you've already had influenza this year, you haven't been vaccinated, please go get vaccinated for influenza. We know and from have good data from previous seasons, there will be other uh, dominant influenza strains circulating later in the season as well. Hey, what a great program today, and thanks to everybody again. And Alexis, here's my final thought. This is round three, right? The first year we didn't really have COVID in the winter, but now it's a third winter with COVID. And you know what? We've been here before, and how do we get through it? We got through it by taking care of each other, by making sure we do the right thing around each other and respecting the need for everyone to try and stay healthy through this time. We'll do it again and uh, we'll be ready, uh, but we're gonna have to probably be a little more cautious than we have been in the last six months. Things are getting a little more serious and it shouldn't surprise us at all because this is a, you know, a seasonality to it. And as people go back indoors, as Dr. Poland mentioned, and things get cold again and people start congregating indoors, especially the holiday season, we expect to see a little bit of a rise. So if you're gonna be around folks who are, are older or immunosuppressed or are more vulnerable, Think about masking again, thinking about keeping a little more distance, doing the things we know that help keep us safe. Because ultimately, the greatest gift we give each other uh, over the Christmas and holiday and, 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 and this season is to make sure that we take care of each other. And if we can do that well, we'll get through round three just fine. Well said. 
Thank Alexis. you, Dr. Stites. This has been a really good show, and thank you to all our viewers for joining us and sending in your questions and joining the conversation. We will be back here Monday morning at 8 a.m. with another morning medical update. Until then, have a great weekend. We will see you Monday morning. Coming up Monday on the Morning Medical Update. Are you female, 40, fertile, and perhaps carrying some added weight? Then you'll want to tune in Monday for the next Morning Medical Update. I'm Jessica Lovell. Those four words describe your risk for gallbladder disease. Combine that with rich holiday foods and you can quickly go from merry to miserable. What you need to know starting at 8. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites Podcasts. Now, everywhere podcasts are available.